tonight. Harris has chosen. A running mate has finally been picked as Minnesota Governor Tim Walz takes his place next to Vice President Kamala Harris. Chaos in Bangladesh. Parliament dissolved as protesters demand a new government separate from total military control. Intensifying crisis. The unrest in the UK continues to escalate with rioters clashing with police forces. And indigenous artistry. Peru is bathed in color as artists put a spotlight on their vibrant heritage and culture. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Avadarana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Vinuth Varnasuriya. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. On the road to the White House tonight, the stunning transformation of the 2024 presidential race will reach new heights when Vice President Kamala Harris unveils her running mate after a sequence of events that left Republican nominee Donald Trump changing course of action. Harris is due to join her vice presidential pick at a rally in Philadelphia that will kick off a joint spring across an electoral map expanded by President Joe Biden's shelving of his own re-election bid just over two weeks ago. Kamala Harris has picked Tim Walls as her running mate for the presidential election. Harris interviewed several top contenders in Washington, D.C. over the weekend and reportedly had not made up her mind until earlier today. The announcement comes as Harris begins a tour of key battleground states, starting with a rally in Philadelphia later today, where Harris will officially introduce Walls as her running mate. Tim Walls is a battle-tested Democrat who served 12 years in Congress before becoming Minnesota governor in 2018. His plain spoke and small-town Midwestern persona could appeal to independent and conservative voters. The 60-year-old led Minnesota through the 2020 protests over George Floyd's death in Minneapolis. Minnesota is arguably less of a swing state but would be a valuable asset for Harris. Bangladesh are waiting to see what unfolds a day after Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina resigned and fled the country. Parliament was dissolved today, a key demand of student protest leaders who have also said they will not accept a military-led government. The country's army chief has promised an interim government and said new elections will be announced. Bangladesh's army chief is set to meet student protest leaders on Tuesday as the country awaits a new government. This comes a day after Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina resigned and fled the country following a violent uprising against her rule. The student leaders who spearheaded the protests against job quotas and called for Hasina's resignation are seeking an interim government with Nobel Peace Laureate Mohammad Yunus as its chief advisor. 84-year-old Yunus and his Grameen Bank won the 2006 Nobel Peace Prize for work in alleviating poverty by granting tiny loans of under $100 to the rural poor in Bangladesh. He was indicted by a court in June on charges of embezzlement, which he denies. Yunus did not immediately respond to a request for comment. 76-year-old Hasina arrived at a military airfield near Delhi on Monday after leaving Dhaka, where she was met by India's national security advisor. Details about her plans remain unclear. India's Foreign Minister Subramaniam Jayashankar addressed a closed-door all-party meeting in Parliament in New Delhi about the crisis in neighbouring Bangladesh. Footage show India's Interior Minister Amit Shah, Defence Minister Rajnath Singh and Opposition Leader Rahul Gandhi, among other political leaders, attending the meeting. India has deployed additional troops along its border with Bangladesh after the political crisis. India shares a 4,000-kilometer border with Bangladesh and has close economic and cultural ties with the country. There are worries that prolonged tensions in Bangladesh could spill over to India, which is seen as having supported Hasina through her 15-year-long tenure, despite her clamping down on dissent and jailing opposition leaders. And over in the UK, large-scale protests have erupted across the United Kingdom in opposition to the government's immigration policies, prompting the UK government to convene an emergency meeting to address the unrest spreading throughout the country. They were prepared for protest, but not on this scale. 
more than four hours, violent clashes erupted across this city, a week on from the horrors in Southport. Community anger now being felt hundreds of miles away. At least a thousand protesters from Stand Up to Racism and a counter group against immigration were behind the clash. As night fell, the protests got more violent. At least three police officers were injured, those in charge, admitting this was a difficult evening. There were 150 officers deployed in the city, but at times it didn't feel enough. The PM's promise of a standby army didn't feel deployed here tonight. The 79th anniversary of the U.S. atomic bombing on Hiroshima, where Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida called for a world free from nuclear weapons, displayed nuclear threats by Russia, making it even more challenging. About 50,000 participants, including ambassadors from 109 countries, sat at an outdoor memorial ceremony held at Hiroshima Peace Memorial Park. Kishida, Hiroshima's mayor Kazumi Matsui, and other participants took part in a wreath-laying ceremony. A peace bell tolled at 8.15 a.m., marking the time the bomb was dropped. The bomb, nicknamed Little Boy, dropped on Hiroshima on the 6th of August 1945 and killed thousands instantly and about 150 40,000 by the end of the year. Japan surrendered on the 15th of August 1945. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. The US is discussing efforts to de-escalate tensions in the Middle East as Iran seems to be preparing harsh punishment against the recent killing of a Hamas leader in Tehran. The matter will also be discussed at an emergency meeting of Islamic nations scheduled for tomorrow. U.S. President Joe Biden convened his national security team on Monday to discuss ways to prevent the crisis in Gaza from becoming a full-blown regional conflict. Biden said he and the vice president were briefed on developments in the Middle East. They received updates on threats posed by Iran, diplomatic efforts to de-escalate regional tensions, and preparations to support Israel should it be attacked again. Biden said they also discussed measures to defend U.S. forces and respond to any attack against its personnel. This comes as several U.S. personnel are believed to be injured after a suspected rocket attack at Al-Assad Air Base in Iraq. Though the source for the attack has not been identified, Iran-backed militant groups have been blamed for previous attacks against U.S. service members in the region. Meanwhile, Washington has been urging countries to tell Iran that an escalation is not in their best interests. On Wednesday, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation is set to hold an emergency meeting in Saudi Arabia at the request of Iran. Foreign ministers of Arab nations will discuss the pressing concerns, including the recent killing of Hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh last week in Tehran. Iran will reportedly seek to convince other nations to support its plans to retaliate against Israel. Meanwhile, Iran's foreign ministry said Monday that Tehran has no intention to increase regional tensions, but vowed harsh punishment for Israel over the assassination of the Hamas leader. Iranian lawmaker Mohammad Hassim Osmani has even called for the assassination of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Still in the U.S., the weather woes continue. Tropical storm Debbie lost some wind speed after slamming Florida's Gulf Coast as a Category 1 hurricane. The National Hurricane Center predicted Debbie would return to drench off the coast of Georgia and South Carolina later in the week. It had weakened to a tropical storm by mid-morning, according to the National Hurricane Center. Roughly 280,000 customers were without power in the state, according to poweroutage.us. Governor Ron DeSantis said the state had been approved for federal disaster assistance on Sunday and that 17,000 workers were on hand to restore power. Hours after the storm's landfall near Steinhatchee, heavy rains were still falling on the beach town. Debbie is on track to unleash a week of torrential rain and catastrophic flooding across the southeast. Forecasters expect four to seven major Atlantic hurricanes in the 2024 season, which would exceed the record-breaking 2005 season that included Hurricane Katrina. Climate scientists believe global warming from burning fossil fuels has raised the temperature of the oceans, making storms bigger and more devastating. Updates on the war in Ukraine now. 
Russia said it had hit various Ukrainian targets, while Ukraine said it had engaged in fighting with the Russian forces in various directions. In a daily report, the Russian Minister of Defense said that the Russian army occupied more advantageous positions on the front line and attacked Ukrainian ammunition depots, electronic warfare base stations and multiple rocket launcher systems. The Russian air defense system shut down various missiles, rockets, aerial bombs and drones launched by the Ukrainian army, according to the report. The general staff of the armed forces of Ukraine also reported on the day that the Ukrainian army engaged in battles with Russian forces in various directions, among which the situation is the most tense in the direction of Pokorsk and Toresk. A Russian missile attack on the city of Kharkiv in northeastern Ukraine damaged a medical clinic and injured at least five people, according to Kharkiv authorities. Authorities. Russia has captured 420 square kilometers of Ukrainian territory since the 14th of June. This is according to Sergei Shoigu, the secretary of Russia's Security Council. Sudan's government denied the existence of famine in the North Darfur Samsam camp for internally displaced people. That contradicts the findings of a global food monitor. Sudan's government on Sunday denied the existence of famine in North Darfur's Zamzam camp for internally displaced people. That contradicts the findings of a global food monitor. The Famine Review Committee said in a report on Thursday that famine, confirmed when acute malnutrition and mortality criteria are met, is ongoing in the camp and likely to persist until at least October. The finding by the Committee of Food Security Experts, linked to the globally recognized standard known as the Integrated Food Security Phase Classification, is just the third time a famine classification has been made since the system was set up 20 years ago. And it comes after more than 15 months of war between the Sudanese army and the paramilitary Rapid Support Forces. The conflict has created the world's biggest internal displacement crisis and left half the population, around 25 million people, in urgent need of humanitarian aid. Earlier this year, aid agency Médecins Sans Frontières said that one child was dying every two hours in the Zamzam camp. MSF said on Sunday that it only had enough therapeutic food to treat malnourished children there for another two weeks. But also on Sunday, Sudan's Federal Humanitarian Aid Commission said that talk of famine was inaccurate. The government body said conditions were not consistent with those that must be met to declare famine. Experts and United Nations officials say a famine classification could trigger a UN Security Council resolution, empowering agencies to deliver aid across borders to those most in need. However, Sudanese officials have said it could be a pretext for international intervention in the country. The Sudanese government blamed the Rapid Support Forces for imposing what it said was a blockade on North Darfur's capital, Al Fasha, that has led to shortages of food and aid. The RSF on Friday declared full solidarity with the victims of the famine and repeated an offer to work with the United Nations to facilitate the delivery of aid. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news right after this. Welcome back. The Cantagallo neighborhood of Lima, the female muralist of the Soinoma Collective from the Amazonian indigenous Shipibo Konibo community, are making their mark in the world of art by sharing their cultural heritage through the beautiful murals. The Soinoma Collective, which translates to women who make beautiful art, is made up of 12 members, most of whom are mothers. The murals they produce typically feature geometric patterns that depict their vision of the world using motifs commonly seen in their traditional embroidery and pottery. Members of the collective views the murals as a method of reminding people in Lima and the rest of the Peru about the existence of the Shipibo Konibo community. The group recently displayed their artwork in an exhibition named Koshi Kene at the ICPNA Cultural Center in Lima. And with that, we mark the end of today's bulletin. We will see you again tomorrow with the latest happenings across the globe. So stay tuned as Anuradhi Vikramasinghe will join you next with the Nightly Business Report. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.